NBC's Vaughn Hilliard is reporting from outside the courthouse in New York City. Also with us, Peter Baker, New York Times chief White House correspondent and MSNBC political analyst. Joyce Vance, former U.S. attorney, professor at the University of Alabama School of Law and MSNBC legal analyst. Jeremy Fallon, former assistant district attorney in the trial division of the Manhattan DA's office and a criminal defense attorney. All right, Vaughn, explain what we learned so far from Davidson on the stand. Keith Davidson, a crucial witness who, frankly, we did not know what he was prepared to publicly testify to. He is somebody that has not been public over the last eight years, somebody who has not given interviews to detail his story. He was working in the form of sort of an agent attorney figure for Karen McDougal and Stormy Daniels in 2016, negotiating the sales of their stories to the National Enquirer, AMI, as well as then Michael Cohen. And he hits at the heart of this in what the actual scheme look like when it came to the actual execution. He testified here with text messages that were provided to this jury in the form of evidence beginning in June of 2016 when he says he went to Dylan Howard, who is the editor-in-chief of the National Enquirer, with, quote, I have a blockbuster Trump story. He texted the editor-in-chief of the National Enquirer. It was one month later that this story, Karen McDougal's story, in which she alleged a 10-month affair with Donald Trump, well married to Melania, was being negotiated between either National Enquirer or ABC. And that is when the editor-in-chief text messaged one month later in July of 2016, Davidson to say, quote, we are going to lay it on thick for her, to which Davidson responded to the National Enquirer editor, good, throw in an ambassadorship for me. I'm thinking of the Isle of Man, to which Howard responded, LOL. This hits at the heart of the acknowledgment that that perhaps Donald Trump was behind this effort to purchase the alleged story of the sexual relations between Karen McDougal and Donald Trump. The prosecution directly asked him, quote, the following, is it safe to say if you close this deal, it would somehow benefit Donald Trump? To which Davidson, again, the attorney representing Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal responded, yes, this is beginning to fill out some of these pieces about the actual negotiations and the extent to which they they had an understanding that this was being directed by not only Michael Cohen, but Donald Trump. Again, we are just at July of 2016 and in the Karen McDougal sale of the story here. So we've still got August, September, October and November to go for Keith Davidson to testify on the exact account from his experience from 2016 ahead of the election here when they come back after the lunch break, Chris. He's only been on the stand a short time, Jeremy, but how strongly does what he said so far lay the groundwork for where they're going. It's very, very efficient and effective because why are we here? What's this about? Well, now you have somebody who says, I was part of that negotiation, separating it from Michael Cohen, because again, the prosecution does not want to solely rest on his shoulders. Now we have someone who's on the inside explaining the purpose of this and the, how it all happened and how it was followed through. It's a very valuable witness. I want to read something that was said, one of the last things that was said in an exchange between um, Steinglass and, and Davidson, the witness. He asks, was AMI attractive because she would not actually have to tell her story, meaning Karen McDougal? Is that why she wanted to go to AMI? Because she wouldn't actually have to tell her story. This is what Davidson says. That was one of her stated goals, and that would be in alignment with one of her very important stated goals. So he essentially says it twice. Are they in that adding to what you just talked about or are they setting her up as someone who really didn't want to hurt Trump, essentially shoring up her credibility before she even takes the stand, assuming she does? Well, it's, it's doing multiple purposes. It's actually explaining and saying, I don't want to go to the other station or the other network or the other resource because I don't want to have to tell my story. I wanted to keep it private for myself. This wasn't out to harm or hurt Donald Trump. This was for me. But at the same time, he throws in that second piece saying, you know, there's two stated goals here. Well, what's that other stated goal? That other stated goal is to get paid and shut your mouth. All right, Joyce, the prosecution called also the head of C-SPAN archives to the stand for a total of 15 minutes, so very brief. But they used his testimony to introduce video of some comments that former President Trump made. And I want to play a portion of what they played. It's a phony deal. I have no idea who these women are. I have no idea. I have no idea. 
And I think you all know I have no idea because you understand me for a lot of years, okay? When you looked at that horrible woman last night, you said, I don't think so. I don't think so. Whoever she is, wherever she comes from, the stories are total fiction. They're 100 percent made up. They never happened. They never would happen. They're all horrible lies, all fabrications. And we can't let them change the most important election in our lifetime. Michael Cohen is a very talented lawyer. So there's a lot there. I'm going to start with the sort of the front part of it, which is, yes, the jury already knows that there are an awful lot of people in Donald Trump's close circle who knew exactly who those women are, including Rona Graff, uh, perhaps one of the top people in his inner circle, sort of his right hand woman. But what we didn't hear there was sort of um, the details of why they played that. Help us understand why that's important, what you think the jury takeaway will be. Right. Prosecutors don't have the luxury of explaining to the jury why they're presenting certain evidence. They simply have to put the evidence in. And it's worth noting here, Chris, that the reason that this gentleman had to fly in from Indiana to testify was because Donald Trump isn't stipulating to anything. This was very clearly an authentic recording, but Trump's team made the people fly the witness in so that he could authenticate it, jump through the legal hoops necessary for this tape to be introduced as evidence at trial. And what it will help the jury understand, what we would expect prosecutors to say when the case gets to closing argument, is that this is what Donald Trump said at the time. And it's very different from what he's saying now. And that suggests a consciousness of guilt.